life and we come to the place where we're ready to wrap this up. We're, we're going to end this entire year series in the next two, three messages. And so I want to see how much you know. How much do you know? Do you, do you know the answer to this question? Where did Jesus go after he, was invited, after he invited Levi, the tax collector, to follow him? Anybody know? To his house. And what, did the, what happened at his house? They ate. They had a dinner party, they, a massive dinner party. All of these individuals that were like tax collectors and sinners are all at this party, and Jesus is there, and it's really cool. If you're worried about a pop quiz, by the way, I, this is the kind of pop quiz that you're you wish your teacher had given you when you were in school, okay? I know maybe, maybe, maybe only one person got it. Maybe, maybe lots of you got it. I don't know. But trust me, you're going to like this pop quiz. Here's the next question. Where was Jesus at when a sinful woman washed Jesus' feet? If you're thinking dinner party, you're right. Where was Jesus when Martha accused Mary of not helping out? Dinner party. Yeah, she's preparing dinner. What did Jesus... See, I told you, you're going to like this quiz. What did Jesus do... You just wish you had a teacher like me. What did Jesus do when he finished teaching a crowd over 5,000? A massive dinner party. My son is catching on. I take back everything I said about you in Sunday school this morning. Okay. My, you'd ask me later. It's funny. 5,000. 5,000 people are fed this massive dinner, massive dinner party. Okay, we'll keep going. Where was Jesus at when he was accused by the Pharisees of not washing his hands? Dinner party. Dinner party. Okay, I think you guys are getting it. All right, we're getting it. What chapter in Luke did I say I wanted you to never forget? Good, you didn't say dinner party. I thought somebody for sure was going to say dinner party. All right, this is the only trick question. Only trick question. Luke 14, very good. Where did most of Luke 14 take place? Dinner party. Dinner party. Good. Where did the rest of Luke 14 take place? Outside the dinner party. It's close, close. What was the rich man doing while the beggar named Lazarus was serving outside his gate? He was having a one-man dinner party because it was his massive feast he was eating. Good. Where, somebody has to be louder than Caden. Come on, it's my son. It's making me look bad. Everybody, shout from the back. Where was Lazarus ushered to by the angels after he died? You're like, he was ushered by angels. Where? Yeah, it was a dinner party in heaven. Come on, I told you, you could get this. You could get this. What did Jesus tell Zacchaeus he was to do after he climbed down from the sycamore tree? Throw, go to his house and throw a dinner party. Still, my son has beaten all of you guys. Come on. What will we be doing right after service today? Okay, yes. I hope, you, I hope you realize that. We have this massive Thanksgiving meal, and it's going to be really cool. All right, so you, you, my son passed the pop quiz. The rest of you, will, I'll turn in your grades later. You'll see. <clears throat> you missed two? Oh, at least you're honest. This, this, was, this is all on the honor system. I'd be in the bag going, yeah, ace that, 100%. <laughs> So, this dinner party thing, having uh, people around your table seems to be a big deal to Jesus, doesn't it? It does. It, 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 this is Luke 14. As we go through Luke 14, Luke wants to focus in on these events uh, around the table. There's something about being around the table that it manifests the generous life. It, it's like the way to show that you are generous with this hospitality thing. This past Tuesday, we obviously our voting side. You pro a lot of people here probably know that because you probably vote here, and it, it's just really cool. We can open up to the community and do that. As I am uh, getting my morning coffee and coming out of Joan's office because that's where our Keurig is, uh, I, I'm yeah, got my coffee in hand. It's my favorite Mickey Mouse mug, and uh, there's this guy walking our direction towards towards the offices and obviously the voting happens in the fellowship hall so it happens that direction and I tell him oh hey voting's that way go ahead and turn around but he looks at my cup and he says to me in a little bit of a country twang he says how much for a cup of hot and dirty now, I, I'd never I would never thought of calling coffee hot and dirty but I figured that's what he was talking about, so I said, hey, you want a cup of coffee? I, I'll make you a cup of coffee, and I said, how do you like it? He looked at me, and he said, hot and dirty. <laughs> I took that to mean black and strong, so I went to make him black and strong coffee, and 
And I told him, hey, go, go ahead and vote. I'll have it here when you come back. What I should have done was told him who to vote for. I, that's, that's worth a cup of coffee, isn't it? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't tell you if I did anyway. So he goes and he comes back, has his coffee. There's, I, I didn't know this guy. I didn't know this guy from, you know, he's just somebody from the community. We have hundreds of people that come through here for voting. And yet there's this little connection made. I like this guy. I mean, I, I imagine that maybe next year he's, he's going to like coming to vote here. He's probably going to seek me out so we can share some hot and dirty together again next year. And maybe he'll come to church sometime. Who knows, right? There's, there's like connections that can be made around the table, and there's something about the table. Now, it doesn't, it, it's not just that when we go to somebody's table or that we invite them to our table, but it could happen when we're taking the potatoes we've been collecting and handing them out at our food pantry to people that are in need, there's connection that is made. And, and you, you, there's something about that, right? When we gather together and we're going to eat together and we sit down and maybe we sit down with a newer family because we want to get to know them or somebody we haven't seen in a long time, we want to get caught up. There's something intimate about a meal, isn't it? And it's what Jesus seems to want to teach us, not just in the words he says at the meal, because those, the lessons he has around the table are absolutely amazing. We've been spending this year looking at them, a lot of them. I mean, everything we went through in the pop quiz, we've talked about together. And, and I don't know if you've noticed it along the way. I tried to point it out. I can't, you know, here we are around the table again, but it's everywhere. It's important to Jesus. It should be important to you and me as well. So, not last week, because last week we talked about the persecuted church. We paused and, and talked about the need to pray for those that are persecuted around the world. If you didn't get a sheet, to pray for a country. Each one of us took a country. Hope you did and, and are praying for that country. My country is Somalia. I've been praying for Somalia. There's persecution going on there like crazy. There are sheets on the Welcome Center. You just grab one of those and pray for a country for the next couple of weeks. Just, just challenge yourself to do that, to get outside of your own prayer needs, own prayer requests. So, that was last week. Before that, we did this mini-series called Scarier Than a Movie, and it was that time period as Jesus approached the cross. So we're still in Luke. We've been in Luke all year. It was that time period where Jesus was approaching the cross, and he was talking about some scary stuff like the day of the Lord and the judgment. And Spencer finished up that series. He did a great job talking about the scariest thing ever, and that is crucifying Jesus that the people actually cried out for his death, God's son's death. They didn't just cry out for it. They argued with Pilate to crucify him, saying, let his blood be on us and our children. I mean, there's nothing scarier than to rebel against God if we believe in the consequences of our choice, whether to choose to follow him or not follow him in our life because it affects our eternal life. So that's where we were two weeks ago, and so we're at the resurrection today. This is Jesus raising from the dead. I want to pick up, though, after where we often go for Easter time is the two, or the three women, Mary Magdalene, the other two, at the tomb. I want to go a little past that to these two individuals who are leaving Jerusalem and heading to their home. It's a small village outside of Jerusalem, about seven miles, called Emmaus. I want to talk about those two individuals and the interaction that Jesus has with them. So here is where we begin. Now, that same day, and that day is the day Jesus rose from the grave, so it's, it's what we would call like the first Easter, right? That same day, two of them, this is in the Greek written in the masculine form, which is fine because it could be two men, but it's very possible, and I just want to put the idea in your head, it really does not matter, but it's just my opinion that these two individuals could be husband and wife because they use the masculine to talk about a couple. So it's very possible, and you'll see reasons why I might say that along the way. Again, that is only trivia and not really that important. That same day, two of them were going to a village. It's, it's a tiny village. This is not a big place called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And so they're leaving. The, the busyness of the feast is over, but there's all this controversy because this Jesus was doing amazing things. They were actually followers of Jesus and loved Jesus. We're hoping he was somebody special. And now they're going back home. And along the way, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, including the, the rumors that the women said that they saw Jesus, or, you know, the, the angel said that Jesus had risen from the dead. As they 
talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, which means he's heading in the same direction. He's leaving Jerusalem, walked up from behind them. They didn't notice because they were engrossed in their conversation. All of a sudden, he's next to them. And they were kept, though, from recognizing him. And there's, you know, you can, you can speculate why is that? Why did God not want his son revealed to these two yet? You know, what needs to happen in order for them to recognize that it's Jesus? You know, I think that all plays into this, but we're not really told up front what's going on. We just know that supernaturally they are kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you guys discussing together as you walk along? So he's going ahead and playing dumb here so that they can not recognize who he is. And I believe he really wants to know what they think of him. They stood still, their faces downcast, so they're sad. One of them, named Cleopas, ask him, and it's interesting that only Cleopas is, is mentioned as far as a name. We don't know the name of the other individual, and that's probably because it's the husband of the household. Just, again, trivia, but uh, that fits with the, with the text. And they say to him, are you, the, oh, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in, in these days? It doesn't make sense to us. I mean, you're coming from Jerusalem, and obviously you're just a visitor, so you're returning, but do, do you not know? I mean, it's been headline news stuff. This, is, this has been on the front pages of the Jerusalem Gazette. I mean, this is big stuff. This is the locker room talk stuff. Don't you know? How could you not know? And Jesus says what things? He continues to play the role. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I mean, Jesus is in the front of their mind, and yet as they're talking to him, they're not seeing him. They're kept from recognizing him. And then they give this testimony. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And that is so true. There's more about Jesus, but that is so true. So they're followers of him. They've listened to him teach. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. They nailed him to a cross. But we had hoped, see this is their faith, we had hoped that he was the one that waited for the Messiah of God, which is also the Christ, who was going to redeem Israel, free them from the bondage of being subjugated under Rome. And what is more, it is the third day since all these things took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. These are the rumors they heard. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. Now, there's more than one woman here, which is good because witnesses have to be at least two in order to be admissible in court. Three is even better, so this is good. There's three. The problem is, in this culture, women didn't get recognized in court. It had to be a man, and so this had to be verified. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, which is, you know, there's testimony. And so the men are going to validate this testimony. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, we know that as Peter and John, and found it just as the women had said. So they validate that part. It's empty. We, the tomb is empty. But him, Jesus, they did not see, and they couldn't validate the second part. And so this couple, or if it's two individuals, good friends, uh, they leave Jerusalem instead of stick around and wait for him to show up if he truly is risen or to find out for themselves. They leave just confused. We don't know what to do with this. We don't know. I mean, the, the women's testimony, it's three of them. It's good testimony, but it's women. The men, they corroborated a lot of it. They just didn't see Jesus. We don't know what to do with this. He said to them, how foolish you are. Now, I don't think he's like ripping them one. I think he's, I think he's really concerned about them. How slow a heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken because he's going to take the time to help them to understand what, this pro what the prophets said about him. He said, did not the Christ, again, Messiah is the Hebrew word, Christ is the Greek word, it, it just means the anointed one of God. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things? Isaiah said that he would be a suffering servant. He'd have to suffer and then enter his glory. And then Jesus does the most remarkable thing. He gives them a Bible study. Can you imagine a Bible study with Jesus? I mean, that's crazy. The author of life just sits down with you and says, let me tell you what this all means. I would love that. He starts right here. He starts right at the beginning because it says, he says, beginning with Moses. You know what Moses means? Now, you, you know the Bible well enough probably that there's not a book called Moses, but there are five books at the beginning of the Bible that were written by Moses. So he says, 
beginning with Moses and all the prophets, you know that the, all the prophets, those are the end of the Old Testament. That's beginning with the major prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and ending with all the small prophets like Obadiah that you didn't even know was in there, right? Uh, they're all the little prophets are in there. And so he says, it's the whole Old Testament. He just goes ahead and cracks it open and begins to show them where Jesus is at. He, didn't you see? Let me, tell, let me show you. I cannot imagine. When I get to heaven... I don't know what the very first thing that I'm going to do. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm going to go hug those that I haven't seen in a long time. I'm going to hug my grandma and my mama, and it's going to be awesome. But right after that, I'm going to say, excuse me, I have an appointment with Jesus. We set it. We, we set it in 2018, and this appointment is very, very important. I, I want to know what this, what this lesson was, the, the most amazing Bible study ever given. I want to hear it from Jesus' own lips. Jesus, show me what it's like. And so Jesus just opens up the scriptures. He explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. He's talking about himself. They just don't see it. So let's pause for a second. These two individuals, whether they're great friends or husband and wife, they have had testimony given to them. Testimony from the women. A lot of that testimony has been supported by the men going and checking things out. In that culture, that's the way it's supposed to be done. What's supposed to be done. And now... They have this amazing Bible study from Jesus himself. Jesus opens up scripture, and yet neither is enough for them. We learn later that their hearts are just burning within them as they hear the scriptures being told, but it's still not enough. They don't see Jesus yet. As they approach the village, this is Emmaus, to which they were going, because that's where they lived, Jesus acted as if he were going further. And I believe Jesus would have continued to walk on if these two hadn't invited them into their home. And so the, Jesus is acting like he's going to walk on. I don't, I don't know if it's like play acting. I think Jesus would have walked on. But they stopped him. They urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. And what's really cool about this is Jesus has been spending so much time talking to us about how important hospitality is. Remember, being around the table, that's, that's, that's hospitality, right? It's so important to invite people into your home. And don't just invite certain people into your home. Invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, those that are broken. Jesus demonstrated what that looks like as he sat down with sinners. He says, these are the people, invite them into your home. Take them in. Fellowship with them. Have compassion upon them. And so Jesus has obviously marked their life in some way because this is a complete stranger to them. I know their hearts are burning within them by the message that he's talking to them about as he opens up Scripture, as Jesus reads or tells the meaning of Scripture to them. But they don't know him. We don't even know if he, they even asked for his name, but they're ready to welcome in, him into their home because they realize that it's late. He cannot keep walking. Even if he has another village to get to, he can't keep walking. They're pretty sure he doesn't belong to this village because it's a small village. They know everybody in this village. They welcome him in. That's obvious that he's been with Jesus and Jesus accepts their invitation. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, let me back up for a second because I, I need to ask you a question. This is pop quiz time again, okay? And my two-star students right up here? Three, three, I'm sorry. Camden's like, excuse me? Am I not here? Am I not a person? Am I invisible? Yes. Let's do the hip-hop quiz again. I, where do you think, I'm going to give you a multiple choice. Where do you think Jesus is going to reveal himself? He's going to reward these individuals. Don't answer, just I, I, I got to uh, give you some choices. He's going to reveal himself. Because these people have shown the kind of heart that God wants. In fact, isn't that the way we're supposed to be? We're supposed to open our door to Jesus and let him into our life. This is where he's going to reveal himself to these two individuals. Do you think, A, that he's going to reveal it on the front porch as they're in the rocking chairs playing some guitar music maybe and singing long going oh my goodness listen to the voice of that and that has to be Jesus nobody sings like Jesus Jesus must have had an amazing voice I mean if Jesus sang he's got to have an amazing voice do you think it was on the front porch or B do you think it was around the fireplace as they're sitting around the fireplace telling stories to each other of their childhood they're kicking back with their feet up on the hearth and they're, they're, they're reminiscing and, and Jesus just goes into this long yarn about, 
You know, when I was seven, my parents just left me in the temple, and I was there for three days, and I thought maybe they didn't even care about me, but I was just talking it up with the religious leaders, and they're like, wow, that is just amazing. You are an amazing child. Wait a second! Jesus told that story to us! <gasps> You're Jesus! Or C, do you think it was around the dinner table? Possibly. What do you think, What? Oh, you didn't even want to talk about it a little bit? No, you're just going to go with C, the dinner table. Yeah, especially since I already showed the verse. I have no self-discipline with this thing. All right, here we go. When he was at the table with them, at the table, he took bread and gave thanks and he broke it. That is the customary way to give blessing in the Jewish culture. You take the bread. Every meal had bread. It was a staple of their diet. You took bread and you gave thanks and you broke it. If you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000, that's exactly what he did. He picked up the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his apostles who then broke it further and gave it to the groups of 50 and hundreds and it began to multiply. It's just absolutely amazing. This is the grace. This is how they did. This is how they gave the blessing over the meal. What is really weird though is that the person who's supposed to be the guest, Jesus, is the one who's taking the role of host here. Cleopas should be the one that gives thanks, gives the blessing, and breaks the bread. But it isn't Cleopas who does it. It's Jesus. Jesus takes over. And isn't that the way it should be? If we invite Jesus into our life, if we want him to be the Lord of our life, then that's what it means to invite him into our life. Then he takes control of our heart. He then becomes the host of our life. And we become, in a sense, the guest. That's the way it ought to be. And so... He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. He's handing it out to them. They haven't even taken a hold of it yet before it dawns on us. Wait a second. Jesus has done this before. I see him now. And so we're told, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. There was this, <gasps> and he disappeared from their sight. That was enough. Then they go and, and report. Well, before they report, they say this. They say to each other, we're in our hearts not burning within us. While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And of course it was because Jesus is giving a Bible lesson like nobody else has ever given a Bible lesson. But remember, it wasn't, it wasn't the testimony of the, of the women that was conferred by the men. It wasn't the scriptures being read. It was Jesus at table handing them the broken bread. It was in that moment. There's something about this table, this fellowship, this hospitality thing. In fact, you could say the table represents generosity. And we've seen this over and over again throughout the Bible. We just may have not been paying attention to it. God often spreads a table to show his grace. It's not just a place where we say grace. It's where God demonstrates grace to us. In fact, remember David as he's describing the, the hand of God that is blessing our lives, that is, that is on our lives. He describes it to himself and then shares it with us that this is, should be our experience. And he puts it this way in the most famous of his writings, Psalm 23, that he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Can you imagine that? He sets out a table for us to sit down and dine while we are in the midst of our trial and our struggle. And while we are there and we, we have bills and we have worry and we, we, we have relationship issues and we don't know how we're going to get past these health concerns and we worry for our mom's health and we've got all these needs. He places this table before us and he, and he pours on us oil and the oil overflows and our cup is so filled with all that is good. That's the description that he gives. And Jesus models for us in this life as he walked along this world, in this world. He modeled for us what it looked like to sit down with those who are broken, sit down with those who were sin-filled, sit down with those who the rest of society treated as a pariah. You don't want to have anything to do with them, Jesus. Those are the people that are, yeah, they're into, no, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, no, no. These are the people I want to sit down with. These are the people I want to eat meal with. These are the people I want to be intimate with. He models for us 
this beautiful connection between the broken and God at table. And not only that, there's, there's these images. We've talked about this before as we've gone through Luke. There's all of these visions that we see throughout Scripture, and Jesus himself just confirms these are true. These visions are true. There's going to be a table spread before us in heaven. You know, the idea of Lazarus going to this glorious banquet in heaven. He's not the only one, Jesus says. We're all going to have that in Christ Jesus. We're not going to be invited to God's table. We're not just going to be invited to any old table. We're not going to sit off in the cardboard table in the other room like when we were in the second class city citizen table, the kids table, the dreaded kids table, right Caden? You're still at the kids table and you will be for a while, you hear me? There's this table of God and God says, I want you to sit at my table. In fact, Jesus himself says that he will get up from the table, he will change into servant's clothes, and he will serve us. Isn't that crazy? That's just absolutely nuts. This is throughout Scripture. There's this idea that the table represents generosity. It's the very grace of God. It's, it's, it's just a way to show it, a way to manifest it. And so a lot of times we think that the way that we're going to reach people is that if we tell them some incredible truths about God and we open up Scripture to them and we point to this verse and we point to that verse and we point to this verse and we point... Can't you connect the dots? If you could just connect the dots, you would know Jesus is real. He loves you. He died for you. Don't you want Jesus? And those people just look at you like the two on the road to Emmaus and say, I don't know, I don't know. You might tell them incredible testimony. Incredible testimony. I mean, you might just spill out how you were just so lost and you were so broken and you had drug addiction and you, your life was in all... Everybody hated you and it, because you had, you had used everyone, you stole money from them and it just was awful. And God got a hold of my life and He turned it around and Jesus is my Savior and He gives me joy every day and I don't feel worthy except in Christ Jesus. You give this beautiful testimony and I mean it brings tears to your eyes, it brings tears to their eyes and they're like, oh man, that's beautiful, but I don't know. I don't know. Jesus says, you know what? Testimony is great. It's all, you need to share it. And the Word of God is truth and truth will set you free, but Here's what I want from you. I want you to recognize that you are to represent me here on earth. You are to be me. What, what the table represents, see, we think that the, the table represents Jesus trying to teach us how to be good hosts to a good dinner party. We think, well, when Jesus says you should invite the lame, the crippled, the blind, and, and, and those that are in need, we should invite those kind of people to our table. He's teaching us how to have the proper table, and he's teaching us how to have a table that looks like the table that is going to be in heaven, and that's so true. But really what Jesus is trying to get us to see is it's not about us being good hosts. It's about us being Jesus. He wants us not to just share truth about Jesus and testimony about Jesus. He wants us to literally, with our love, share Jesus. That's when their eyes will be open. I remember <laughs> several years ago, in fact, I can never forget this. A man came into the church and was asking to see the pastor, and John pokes her head in, the, in my office door, and she says, there's a man here, he needs to see you, and she kind of whispers in a low voice, I think he's going to ask for money. You know, how does she draw that conclusion? Well, as soon as I walked out of the office, I knew exactly how she drew that conclusion. Because he didn't look like he had anything. I have to admit to you, and this is only fair for you to know, that I did not get up out of my chair immediately. And I didn't have like this incredible exuberant joy, like, oh boy, I get to go help somebody. I know you have this idea that pastors always have their compassion tanks full. That is so wrong. There are days where I just do not want to love you. Is that okay? There are some days, Julie, ministry is messy. We've been saying that for 13 years together, haven't we? Yep. There are times where I just don't want to deal with it. And here's the reality. I have been doing this for so long. I have seen so many who have need, and, and I've heard so many stories, and some of those stories, oh, they're heart-wrenching, and some of their stories are just flat-out lies. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And I have been taken before. Angie and I used to live on a pretty busy highway right next to a little country church and the downside to having a parsonage next to a church well first of all we, we had 
uh, a cemetery that surrounded our backside and surrounded the other side of the church. And so I always tell people we had the best neighbors. They were so quiet. But being where we were on a busy highway meant we would get knocks on the door at all hours of the night with people in need. And so we've heard lots and lots of stories. And some of those, you know, you just like, you got to verify it if you can. You know, you got to be good stewards of the church's money. And we try to verify, and, you know, some of them just didn't pan out because they were taking us or trying to. And I know in some cases we were taken. In other cases, we stopped it before we were. But, and, and I know that's happened to all of us. I mean, you see the person on the side of the road, you can't help but have compassion for you. You should, and sometimes you help and you just like I know they're gonna spend that on alcohol and I don't know what else to do and so you know when somebody comes in and says hey I have a need I, I'm not I'm not automatically just like my tank is full I'm ready to just pour out all this compassion so I kinda just saunter out there like I gotta hear his story because what if it's real what if it's true this time and sometimes it is I gotta hear his story and I, I met the man, and a nice man, a, a shorter man, and, and sat down at the table, and we just started talking. And I was amazed because his story was pretty short. I thought I was going to hear this long, drawn-out tale, because it usually goes on. I mean, you're talking 20, 30 minutes at times. And what's also amazing, you ought to know this, some of the stories are like identical which means there are people out there that pass along stories to others, like, hey, this one worked for me. You ought to give them this story. Isn't that sad? It kind of makes you, it kind of makes you a little rough on the edges, which is not the way we're supposed to be. And yet, this guy just told his story, and it was quick, it was short, and I just was like, oh, we're done already? And I just looked at him, because I think I missed something in that story. I, I just looked at him, like, um, so... What is it you need? What do you want? And he looked at me, he said, honestly, I just want a hot meal. It's been a long time since I've had a hot meal. All of a sudden, my inside, everything changed. I'm like, is that all you want? I said, let's go. We went to McDonald's and had a big breakfast. No, I mean, really, that's what they call it, a big breakfast. They're not very creative at McDonald's, but we got a big breakfast and coffee. A little bit of hot and dirty, although I didn't know it was called hot and dirty at that time. <laughs> and, and we just had breakfast together and talked, and he shared his story, and it was kind of cool. I mean, it was a longer story than when we sat in the, out here at the table. He shared his, his, you know, life story. And I was not at all like, uh, how long is this going to last? We were enjoying each other. There was connection. And, and when it was all over, I... I I prayed with him, and, and he thanked me, and that was it. I look back on that, and I'm like, oh man, I didn't, even, I didn't even share my testimony. I didn't do like a big Bible study. I didn't go through any verses with him. I just listened and asked questions and prayed with him. But you know what? I think it was enough. I broke bread with him. I mean, it was, it was pancakes, but, you know, it's bread. It's kind of bread. There's nothing magical in that breakfast. Come on, it was McDonald's. In my opinion, there's nothing magical about McDonald's. But we had connection. And, and I don't understand why it is that Jesus wants us to eat together and I don't even think it's eating together. I, I think that is just the symbolism that represents all the ways in which we can have connection with people when we serve them. And again, I said, you know, when you're handing out potatoes to people at the food pantry or you, you sit down at a meal with somebody you, you don't know, I mean, those are great ways to connect, but there are other ways to do it too. When, when you go out and you rake the yards of people in need, I mean, you're being Jesus to them right? You're being the hands of Jesus. And that is the best way that we are going to change this world. I believe that somewhere along the way, we have gotten our faith wrong. Now, I, I don't mean our faith in Jesus, because I think we got that right. I mean, he is the son of God. He has died for our sins. He has risen victorious over death. I mean our lived out faith. We've got it wrong. We think that following Jesus means we believe a certain set of truths about Jesus. It doesn't. Following Jesus means he already assumes we believe that. 
Following him means we believe his teachings enough to live it, that we're going to live as he lives. And what did he do? He sat down at tables with sinful, broken people, and he handed them bread. Shouldn't we do the same? We need to get to the place where we are not just believing our faith is all about the list of things we believe about Jesus. But our faith is complete trust in the teachings of Jesus that we're going to live out His truth. We're going to live His life. We're going to truly follow Him. And the great place to start is around the table. So, my challenge for you this week is to find a way that you can spend some time with somebody in an intimate setting like a table. Again, it doesn't have to be a table. It's just, that one makes sense to me. It made sense to Jesus. It's where Jesus liked to do it. Just come to my table. Have you ever just stopped a newer family in the hallway and said to them, where are you going for lunch today? Now, don't ask that question today because I know where you're going to lunch. You're going over there for lunch because it's going to be absolutely amazing. There's ham, there's turkey, there's stuffing. I love Thanksgiving food. Oh, I love Thanksgiving food. And we're going to have lots of it, including pumpkin pie. It's going to be glorious. The question isn't where you're going to have lunch today. We know where you're going to have lunch today. But have you ever just stopped and asked a newer family on any other Sunday but today, do you have lunch plans? What if we became the church? What if we became the church that was known for not just amazing hospitality because we serve coffee and all of those little goodies? You guys, we get you jacked up on this stuff so you can stay awake. You understand that, right? It's all, it's all purposeful. What if we became known not just as those with just beautiful greeters and you guys have beautiful smiles and you're filled with all kinds of joy? What if we became known as the church that when we, when you come in here, not only do we try our best to remember your name and go up and say hi to you the next week, and I know it's hard for everybody to do that, but we're the church that actually invites you out to lunch. Yeah, I know. I agree with you. We should do that, shouldn't we? Let's be that church. All right, here's what we got to do. We need to offer an invitation because you may be sitting there thinking, all right, Jesus is, is, is coming to this world and, and sits down with sinners, but you don't understand what I have dealt with. Listen, Jesus would sit down with you in a heartbeat. In fact, he'd bypass the rest of our tables and find yours and sit down. He would look at the, around the room and he would go, okay, who is it that is most broken right now? Isn't that the opposite of what we do? He would look for the most broken person in the room. And maybe it's a secret thing. You're not sharing with anybody what you've done or what you're thinking about or what you're broken with. He would sit down at your table and you'd be like, oh, he's at my table. I must be the worst one in the room. <laughs> but you also ought to be like, oh, wow, he still loves me. That's cool. That's awesome. I want to give you an invitation. The invitation is that you could come up here and just give your life to Jesus. An invitation just means it's your invitation to just surrender your life to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Now, there's other things that I invite you to do. There's a yellow card, and on that card, there are things for you to check. If you've been thinking about, oh, I just don't know, I want to talk to Jeff privately about this before I go forward, that's where you check that. I look at each one of those cards each week. You check, I want to talk about a relationship with you. I want to talk about baptism. I, I really want to talk about membership. What, is, what does that involve? Check those things, and then I'll get with you this week. And we'll, we'll talk. Maybe you've done that, and we've met, and you're ready to come forward and give your life, or you just, you've got to do it today. You just feel God pulling on you today. You just do it. This is your invitation. So I'm going to invite you to come as we sing. We're going to stand. I'm going to pray. Father God, we're asking for you to continue to move among us this morning. To continue to pull us towards you and let us know that you're the one that hands out the bread. You're the one that offers 
the invitation. You're the one that gives yourself to us. You are an awesome, awesome God. Father, I pray for decisions today, and I pray that you'll be glorified in them. I pray for whatever people are struggling with as well, that you will be the answer to that, and that they will know that you don't just show up to share bread, you show up to share life. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a decision this morning, come.